Good evening, everyone. I'm your host, Jason Miles, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. So glad to have you here with us uh, as we were getting ready in the virtual green room and looking over to our, to our, will be my right, I can't speak for everyone else, and we can see in the chat move some of the comments that you guys made for why we were a bit tardy are hilarious by the way my favorite so far is uh, jason is trying on different outfits and ben is <laughs> trying to tell me to pick just one <laughs> no that's not why we were late we were just telling jokes with each other in the back because we haven't been on the same screen together in a long time. And we haven't been all in the same place in a long time. For those new to the show, thank you so much for checking this out. If you enjoy what you're seeing, hopefully you hit like and subscribe on your way out and become part of the gang. And for those returning people, glad to have you back. This is going to be a fun show because... Uh, when Ben hit me up about the article, I said, I think it would make sense to bring on, you know, some of the foreign policy members of the Central Committee. So coming in hot somewhere in the in the great northwestern region of British Columbia, please welcome Deep State Kumba. Hello, everyone. Um, I guess in the Central Committee, I would be the Vice Commissar for Ewok Affairs. <laughs> <laughs> and we have we have actually um, everyone's favorite professor at Missouri State University, and he is being joined by his soon-to-be five-year-old son, me, Jean Bajlan. Eid Mubarak, comrades and friends, Jejne Prozbe, and long live the fighters of Modi. I'm waiting to see the first person to get canceled for a Dune related tweet. Never mind. It's misconstrued as support for Hamas. Yeah, I'm waiting for that. I've turned my Facebook feed into basically a Dune meme feed. And don't you feel better already? I feel so much better. All I see is Dune memes. Now you see why all I do is, is try to find toy memes and silly stuff because I don't want to see. Check what we've got. We've the, got. What is that? Is that a Ninja Turtle? That's Rocksteady. That's a Ninja Turtle. Oh. Well, it's not a Ninja Turtle. It's an He's enemy. a Ninja Turtle antagonist. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, get it right, bro. I really hope you didn't call it a Ninja Turtle. Yeah, natural allegiance to losers. Oh. Like it. <laughs> no, it's an accident. <laughs> But that's what you get for getting that kid rock steady and not a ninja turtle. Well, it was his pre- it was a present from his uncle. What a mean uncle. It's not mean. What's wrong with Rocksteady? He's a good character. <sighs> Rocksteady, Bebop and Rocksteady actually are the ones who, at the end of the day, get the fuel that they need to get the technodrome from out of the center of the earth. Because the They're turtle the essential is- proletarian. Yeah, like like they mess up everything for every single episode, but there's one episode where Shredder and the Turtles are off doing some real dumb shit, and then Bebop and Ro- everybody's like not paying attention to Bebop and Rocksteady, and they just steal some nuclear missiles, and boom, the Technodrome's back on Earth. So I think to Bebop and Rocksteady deserve a lot more credit, and I think, frankly, it's racist that people are against Bebop on Rocksteady because they're coded black, and they're portrayed as being uh, stupid, right? Just like Michelangelo, right? And the reason they put Michelangelo in that don't take don't take drugs advert was because that was part of Michelangelo's community service, right? Yeah, Not- but he's coded. Is he coded black? I always uh, thought of him as a California surfer dude. Yeah, yeah, maybe he's coded travel. Yeah, he's coded. But Bebop and Roxanne are definitely coded as people of color, and Shredder is a Mexican. Uh, Uncle Phil? Yeah, Uncle Phil, yeah. Uncle Phil is also the voice of Rao the Conqueror of the World in Fist of the North Star. I didn't know that. 
the American. Anyway, bring Ben on because we're supposed to be talking about something serious. Speak for yourself. Are land acknowledgments simply performative liberal politics, or can they help us in having a better understanding of the history of a settler colonial past? Our guest today points out the more problematic aspect of denying one human rights, regardless of whose ancestors were there first, from Ben Burgess's piece in Jacobin titled, No One's Rights Should Depend on Where Their Ancestors Lived. The great German socialist thinker, August Babel, famously said that anti-Semitism is the socialism of fools, since anti-Semites tend to scapegoat cabals of Jewish bankers for the problems of an entire economic system. To tweak Babel's uh, observation a bit, this kind of rhetoric about all Israelis being settlers whose presence in their country is illegitimate represents the anti-Zionism of fools. Zionism should be rejected because ethnostates are wrong in principle. No nation state should be a state of a specific ethnic religious subset of its residents. And the most just solution would be a single secular democratic state with equal rights for everyone. People who insist that Palestinians are indigenous and Israelis are not, and who think this is what makes the struggle for Palestinian rights legitimate, are embracing the logic of reactionaries like Tenny and Shapiro. We're going to get into that later in the show. While reversing the implication, the problem with the rights claim that Israel is justified in denying basic rights to millions of people because of historical Jewish claims to Judea and Samaria is not that the right wingers are misidentifying who counts as truly religious or indigenous. The wildly reactionary premise is that this is even a relevant question. He's the host of Give Them an Argument, my former neighbor and my current best friend. Please welcome Ben Burgess. Yeah, uh, Michelangelo isn't black. Uh, his, uh, I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure. I mean, obviously, he's like one of this, like, uh, brood of turtles who was, you know, who was raised in the sewer. But in terms of the sort of human he's coded as, I think approximately Michelangelo is like a dude who grew up in Santa Monica, who's like dad is Jewish and like his, you know, his his mom is like. I say he's a beastie boy. You know, laps <laughs> Presbyterian. You know, that's, uh, that's that's who that's who Michelangelo is. He was always my favorite turtle. <laughs> but that's that's the human of Michelangelo. You're you also point out that the turtle, the turtle part that's very urban, right? <laughs> Yeah, the city. I've been I've never heard anybody make a Dude. turtle sound offensive, <laughs> and then you meet Gene. Challenge Bobby. accepted. Right? Also, I think it's, <laughs> yeah, also, I think it's fine to to give to give Zal a uh, a rock steady. I mean, I was, uh, you know, when I was, uh, you know, when I was like. 13 14 and my my brother and my cousin were like six and seven you know i mean they were always played turtles and i always played shredder happily right you know that's the we can uh we can embrace all of the characters in the strange melodrama to me there's certain characters that when you get them as a child they're the characters that were in the bargain bin <laughs> like uh it, like i'm so i'm older than everybody so star wars characters like the white guy <laughs> had a mechanical thing on his bald head from Cloud City. Yeah, I remember him. He didn't even have a gun. He just had like a flowy little. He had a speed gun because he hands out traffic tickets. <laughs> Cuba knows him. He probably promoted him. <laughs> he got promoted. He's, he's, he's an alderman now. He's an alderman of Cloud City. <laughs> He's the old man of Cloud City. Yeah, he's, he's Cloud City. <laughs> Lobot, yeah. If you had Lobot, that <laughs> meant that somebody got that on the way to your birthday party at McDonald's. It's brutal. Yeah, he used to be an elder, but he got the job uh, giving out the traffic tickets. It was like a political uh, boondoggle job, you know, that like... Tommy you know, Hall of Cloud City. That's he only has to work for 45 minutes exactly. a week. He draws his paycheck. The Lobots that, that guy, are not a huge... Uh, that guy and the pilot, pilot also the pilot for the cloud city do, do like plane and the dude whose arm was like this yeah, yeah so all yeah, he could do was salute horrible to someone, someone needs to do a, <laughs> they need to do a reboot they need to do a cloud city spin-off series based on the wire 
That's what we need. <laughs> I mean, the game is someone getting chucked off by Cloud City. That's what. <laughs> See, he's quite happy with his rock steady. Rock steady has a gun. A speed gun. Rock steady has a gun. Does Michelangelo have a gun? No, he just has, you know, a quarter bag of weed. <laughs> <laughs> A quarter bag of weed. And, some, and like, some nunchucks. He's so, basically every 15-year-old. Wait, 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 wait. I, th I, thought, I thought you said that Michelangelo is black-coated. No, so no. I, I, that, I, I, Ben's persuaded me that he he is prob due to he's probably due to certain features, he might actually be descended from Ben's people. <laughs> yeah. So he actually he's a he has a right to Alia, and now he's retired, right? He's basically, um, he's probably got Lenny Kravitz's uh, racial makeup. Are we uh, doing racial, ra are we doing race? I figured time? we were going to ease into it, maybe, towards the race end, because I do have some, like, setups for those. Uh, get get to it. I'm, I'm, I'm But we, we, you know, sometimes you just skinny dip in the deep end as you walk into the public pool. <laughs> ben... <laughs> <laughs> sure. Welcome. For those new watching the show, welcome to This Is Revolution. Uh, ben, you start your <laughs> Ben, you start your article off discussing New York Congresswoman Congresswoman Claudia Tenney. Yes. She is introducing an act that will stop referring to the West Bank in Gaza as the West Bank, the occupied West Bank, and call it Judea and Samaria. Has the right adopted the liberal speak uh, of indigenous ancestral lands and land acknowledgements? Yeah, so I mean, some of them certainly have, right? So the, the two, uh, so I, you know, kind of start out talking about Claudia Tenney because that's the news hook. And I also think it's very funny to think about uh, Claudia Tenney um, representing New York 14. So that's an upstate New York congressional district uh, who, you know, wants to U S government documents to refer to uh, the West bank as Judea and Samaria. And, you know, the idea seems to be that Israel should have a claim to the West bank because uh, there were these, you know, ancient Jewish kingdoms there thousands of years ago. When, of course, we could go back just a few hundred years and New York 14 was by and large uh, the uh, Iroquois Confederacy, right? That's mm -hmm. that's where, uh, you know, that's where that was. Uh, and uh, presumably, you know, she uh, presumably Claudia thinks that she should be allowed to, you know, uh, <laughs> have political rights and, you know, and all that stuff uh, there, despite not being, you know, descended from uh, from that earlier group. Uh, and then the other example I give is a friend of the show, Ben Shapiro, who, uh, <laughs> is, uh, um, who, uh, recently was at, uh, the Cambridge union and, uh, you know, argued with the students there. It's the, it's, it's Ben Shapiro's favorite thing to do is, is argue with college students, undergraduates. Uh, but, um, in this case, he was doing it at a fancy setting at the Cambridge union. And uh, there's, you know, part of that where he, uh, you know, he was talking about the left and decolonization, all that. He said, look, Israel should be the ultimate example of decolonization in world history. A <laughs> native population returned after all this time. And, you know, and yet people don't see it that way. Um, and so, so, and, and it, there is to me this, this, this kind of funny, you know, coming together like this, you uh, this way that in, you know, making these arguments, they've, you know, for one, they've done a complete 180, right, over like historical Zionist arguments. That if you go back and read, um, you know, your Theodore Herzl's, uh, you know, your Jabotinsky's, you know, he was the sort of founder of what was then called revisionist Zionism, which is the sort of right wing of the Zionist movement that, that like, is sort of a lineal ideological descent to uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, these people, uh, you know, would just write all this stuff about, yeah, how, yeah, we're, you know, we're bringing like, you know, European civilization in this savage place. Uh, but, um, but yeah, now you do have this sort of strange 
uh, adoption of this uh, anti-colonialist rhetoric by some Zionists who said, no, no, no. Well, if you think about it, right, really Jews are the indigenous people because there are these Jewish kingdoms there thousands of years ago. And so that's what grounds uh, the, uh, the claim to the land. And thinking about this, you know, got me thinking about the conversation that you and I had with Amber Frost, uh, where we were talking about, you know, land acknowledgements. And, you know, and, and I think that people spend a lot of time having these very weird arguments about, you know, exactly whether the people that the Palestinians are currently, you know, the current Palestinians are descended from, you know, where exactly they lived 500 years ago or whatever, <laughs> and people get very invested in this. And, you know, my view is that none of that should matter, that nobody's rights should depend on where their ancestors uh, lived, that, you know, this is a sort of very uh basic, you know, question of the sort of foundational principles of the left, you know, going back to the French Revolution is that everybody is born with the same package of rights, right? Nobody should have more or fewer rights than anybody else because of who their ancestors were. Mm -hmm. uh, what, you know, ethnic, tribal, religious, racial group uh, they, uh, they, they come from. Um, and this is, you know, the problem with, you know, the problem with, with, with Israel really has absolutely nothing to do with this sort of question of firstness that it's like, okay, do we start the firstness clock, um, you know, a hundred years ago or 150 years ago, or we start it like 2000 years ago. Uh, I don't think any of that matters. And I think, I think one way of showing why it doesn't matter, at least to leftists, uh, is, to just ask yourself a very simple question, right? Like imagine for the sake of argument, obviously this is not what happened in real history, right? But, um, but imagine for the sake of argument that uh, the first Palestinian families had arrived in that territory like one generation before the first Zionist settlers showed up in the 1870s, or for that matter, that they'd showed up at the same time. Would anything that has happened since then be any more just or okay if that were the case, right? If you imagine, you know, Palestinians having showed up from other Arab countries in the 1870s at the same time as the first wave of Zionist settlers, uh, would it then have been okay to ethnically cleanse them from big parts of the country in 1948 uh, during uh, the war that created Israel? Would it be okay to then deny those refugees the right of return? Would it be okay to uh, to absorb the West Bank into Israel for every legal and practical purpose, except for giving people their citizenship and relocate Israeli citizens there and, and give them all the rights that other Israelis have while continuing to deny those rights to Palestinians there? It seems to me that all of those would be equally objectionable in that scenario and that there is something... You know, and I know this is what uh, pissed off certain segments of left Twitter and certain kinds of left academics when the article came out. But um, I, I think that the idea that there are that like particular ethnicities have like innate genetic connections to certain pieces of land is a very fundamentally reactionary idea. And that um, this is something that should just be rejected outright. So you don't believe Jews are in Hollywood? Um, I'm not at privilege. I'm not at liberty to disclose uh, that. Uh, but you know, you did so, relocate to your ancestral land. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. I recently made Aaliyah to Hollywood, so uh, to you know, live in LA. So, uh, so yeah, I'm actually okay with that one. But yeah, otherwise, I saw your executive producer credit on. Uh, that M. Stone film. So yeah. at that point, I'm like, oh, I see. Back to his roots. Uh, Gene, did you want to add to that? No, I, th I mean, like, I thought the reaction of certain elements of left Twitter to Ben's article was a little bit hysterical. Um, you know, people, you know, people like to one up each other and stuff like that. So we can put this kind of stuff aside. But the fact that people got so angry about it does speak to a fact that, you know, we can use terms like settler colonialism as a paradigm for understanding the creation of the state of Israel. We could talk about settlers in a uh, in a kind of 
in a uh, you know in a historical sense those are all legitimate ways to talk about the fo the formation of the state of israel but i think what ben gets at in his article is that in terms of a concrete solution and the way forward that really doesn't have any bearing on on, on the fundamentals of of the problem whether the palestinians appeared from the ground from nowhere in like 1940 to or whether they you know the indigenous people of this society it doesn't change the fundamentals of why they should have equal rights why they should have equal rights uh, in this country and i think the problem was uh, and again i would distinguish between like a a kind of an academic discussion over the process of nation forming in Israel and how we use certain terminologies and how certain terminology like colonialism and settler colonialism are useful for explaining the differences between one type of nation formation and another. That's all fine. But when these terminologies are imbued with a kind of certain moral righteousness to them, you end up with basically kind of an inverted uh, types, uh, you know, just a inverted moral high uh, high ground. It becomes a a who was here first and who has the concrete rights to this land uh, uh, dispute, uh, which is a which I find is a completely futile way. And for people who are pro Palestinian, leads you into this ridiculous kind of argument over the which community was there first, like who is genetically the truest uh you know son of this particular land and i feel that that is a completely pointless uh uh political argument and the left not sh only shouldn't engage it but should actually actively avoid that kind of discussion and i think back to something my dad told me years ago when he was a student in baghdad you know as with many nationalist conflicts you often have one side trying to delegitimize the existence of another side and the uh you know the arabs would say kurds are a made-up nation you know they were made up a hundred years ago but my dad said okay that's all true so we still want our equal rights doesn't matter if i came back so i think i think ben concretely on this point that that um on, on concretely on this point of the history the deep history of israel palestine and who was there first really is a complete distraction from what the fundamental I I issue is and frankly i think falling into that trap uh is a mistake not that the left matters at all as they have no influence over policy so this is basically arguing over the kind of it's like a group of nerds arguing over how uh, danny de villeneuve should direct the third part of the dune movie it's an interesting discussion but we have no influence over that but i think oh ben i could actually help with that <laughs> but uh but i you thought, have some I, thoughts i thought i thought i thought ben ben's core point as to you know who was there first and indigenous versus settler colonial that is a useful historical paradigm to understand the question but it's not a useful political un, uh, uh, paradigm to understand any type of left-wing political solution to this based on the universal principles of uh you know 1789 or 1776 even though those principles are often you know hypocritically applied they are kind of a good yardstick i think for us to base what would be a just solution to the israel palestine question kuba now i'm gonna shout at my son <laughs> so i'm let me observe something uh, a little different which is why is it that the indigeneity debate is has even become an issue and why is there this response from certain segments of the left to anyone who refuses to forward claims um of palestinian indigeneity uh, and i think that there's a sense that with as little influence as the left has the gaza offensive is such a serious issue and the status of palestinians has been such a calamity for so long that we just use every rhetorical tool that we have every rhetorical weapon all we can do is tweet all we can do is post all do all we can do is talk so don't deprive us of anything if we can't beat them on uh 
political universalist program, then we'll beat them on this indigeneity thing. And um, when fighting Zionism, you can't adhere to the niceties of having a consistent intellectual position. I think that's a mistake, but I think that that's uh, an attitude that's common on the left, even if many people won't necessarily admit to it. And for me, it's obvious that the indigeneity approach is uh, one that's completely incoherent in the, if you try to apply it to any political uh, question. Uh, every piece of territory has had a history of settlement long enough so that different groups have been there at different times. Um, no one evolved in situ, right? The Irish didn't climb out of the caves of... Are you sure Donegal. about that? Are you sure about that? <laughs> yeah, they uh, pull themselves they, one they by one. from the bog. Bogs. Jesus. Um, no, uh, people arrived to the different modern nations that their descendants now inhabit in different waves. Some groups came earlier. Uh, some groups came later. And so the claim to indigeneity is one that gets bogged down in historical debates and reify the identities that we have today, the ethno-national groups that we belong to with, um, and then backwards project that, that these bones are Irish bones, these bones are Israeli bones, these bones are Palestinian bones. I don't know if, what the level of continuity is between the biblical Canaanites, who probably have the strongest claim to indigeneity in um, the Levant, and contemporary Israelis or contemporary Palestinians or um, Somalis or Yemenis. In all likelihood, everybody who has one ancestor from that region has a little bit of indigenous Israeli-Palestinian in them. But if you're leading a life on the other side of the planet, and this has nothing to do with your contemporary reality, then why should it matter? And similarly, if you don't have that blood quantum, but your family lives there, your life is there, you're, you've been um, inhabiting there for generations, just not back in the Ooga Booga days, then why would that curtail the type of life that you can experience in uh, the place that you live? And many contemporary states are organized along ethno-national lines. Uh, Poland, for instance, is an ethno state. There's problems with that. There's reasons why it went that way instead of um, becoming a post national or multi ethnic or um, a state defined along other grounds. But that doesn't change the fact that we really should be considering the experiences, the needs, the rights of people who live in places at this moment in time that we can still help, that can still suffer rather than backcasting to some idealized point where um, we start the indigeneity game. Yeah. And this, and, and, this, oh, can oh, I sorry, just add Dean. something? Yeah. There's, there's nothing particularly unique about Israel either, right? The thing I always think about Israel, it's, it's a nation, like a lot of other nations, which are invented in the modern era, number one. What makes Israel a little bit different is that it's like, it's like another nation, but it's like they did the wiring in a weird way. So now you can see all the wiring on the outside. So it looks superficially different. But at the end of the day, you know, you can situate the violence that's taking place in Israel, pa Palestine in a broader historical context. A lot of the people on the left today crying their eyes out on, on uh, uh, and rightly so about what's happening in Gaza at the moment. It's absolute barbarism what's be, what's taking place there. But they've just spent the last 10 years shilling for the Assad regime, which has also deployed similar le levels of sectarian violence against uh, organizations and groups. You have a whole history of uh, you know, from the early 20th century and the failure of the constitutional revolutions in the Middle East, a degeneration and retreat into, uh, you know, ethno-national violence. And that takes different, that has different expressions in different regions. I think it's impossible to deny that there is a quote-unquote settler colonial aspect 
to the Israeli project, which isn't present in other parts of the Middle East. But at the end of the day, the crime is the crime. Whether you travel from across the sea to cut someone's throat and steal their land, or you do it to your next door neighbor, it's still the same fucking crime. Greeks and Turks, Greeks and Armenians lived alongside each other, and the, uh, there were horrendous levels of uh, uh, theft and violence directed against those communities. Throughout the 80s and 90s, my, uh, you know, my family's people, Kurds, were ethnically cleansed and had their lands appropriated and taken. Today, in Afrin, the Turkish government is settling Palestinian refugees from Israel in houses stolen by, stolen from uh, uh, Kurdish families there. So, a, the pro, uh, you know, we should separate the 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 kind of like the barbarism of Israel towards the Palestinians uh, uh, from the kind of hypocritical way that certain people start like freaking acting out about this issue and getting mad if you don't use the proper, uh, if you don't pr uh, use the proper terminology, if you're not hardcore enough about being an anti-Zionist. What the fuck does that Zionism mean today? It's, to, you know, a hundred years ago, Zionism meant many different things. It's just it's Israeli nation state nationalism. And Israel has a particularly vicious and exclusionary na uh, yeah. nation state nationalism. But it's not something that's totally unique that only lives, that only exists in Israel. But for, for a reason that, uh, for a variety of historical reasons, people in the West are A, either hysterically in favor of Israel or hysterically opposed to Israel. Like what makes the Israel-Palestine question such a big question on the international scene is that there are a whole lot of groups that have a deep interest either in the survival of Israel as an ethno-state or, you know, the destruction of Israel as, as an ethno-state for different reasons. But, you know, there's nothing particularly unique about this pro problem and there's nothing particularly strange about what Ben said, that the solution to this problem should be based upon, as far as possible, a, a notion of civic equality. And, you know, people like crapping their pants about this and going like liberal Zionist that, liberal Zionist that, go fucking virtue signal in Toronto, right? Go, you know, go where, no offense, Cuba, Canadians, <laughs> but like... I'm really quite fucking sick of it, to be honest. Yeah, can, I'm, can, quite, I'm, see, I'm, I'm quite, I'm quite, I'm quite sick of it. I'm quite sick of all these assholes who, for the last ten fucking years, have been making every excuse for the Assad regime to bomb the shit out of. Oh well, they were Islamists. Well, guess what? Hamas are Islamists. You can fucking pretend that they're not Islamists, but they are Islamists. They don't have a political solution for any of this, and so you know, people getting mad at Ben for having, you know not framing the question precisely how they want to frame it is just the absolute pathology of the left. We could disagree. Like I'll give credit where credit is due. Donald Parkinson from, uh, from uh, Cosmonaut, he, he, he disagreed with Ben and he laid out his reasons. I think he offered a fair critique perhaps according to how he is defining the term settler colonialism. But, you know, you get, when we say settler colonialism, there are academic definitions. There are different academic uh, defin uh, definitions of the term. But then there's also the way that it's just used in political ven vernacular, just as a kind of like settler colonialism means that you can, you know, go cut the throat of anybody. It's like, look, I think that if you're having a rave next to the Gaza Strip, right? And you're just like being hedonistic. It's kind of a little bit, there's something wrong with that. I think it shows a pathology in the society. I think you'd have to be a bit nuts to want to go rave next to the Gaza Strip. But the the punishment for being a kind of selfish asshole shouldn't be getting killed, right? So, you know, I just think, I think a lot of people are virtue signaling around the left. And, you know, the hysteria from Zionists are, is always like, oh, this is all about anti-Semitism. Well, never assume anti-Semitism when brain-dead third-worldism and, and uh, Maoism could be a better reason why people are having such freaking dumb takes on this. Palestinian political organizations have better takes on this issue you know, PLO in the 70s is talking about a secular, a unified state for everyone. Even Hamas says that it doesn't want to mow mow the entire Jewish population. Whether they really believe that or not, whether we could trust Hamas as a political... Doubtful. That's a different question. But if you're a 
like these absolute brain dead fucking morons who are like pretending that, you know, like Hamas is just a your friendly neighborhood nationalist organization. Well, like it's, it's an Scout. Islamist freaking organization. Yeah, it's not Al Qaeda, but like, let's not pretend. Uh, no, anyway. no, and I really, I really like your point about how this is, um, that how some of the like gray zone people, for example, Ooh, and this is name, not name, like, because like this might superficially sound like what Gene said, like I think a much worse argument that people will make, you know, that like Zionists will make, let's say, oh, why are you getting mad about this and not about this and that and the other thing, which is, you know, of course, just the sort of perennial what aboutery of defenders of, uh, of anything that's indefensible, right? Like this is like, you can go back to the 80s and find uh, op-eds in defense of apartheid South Africa. They're like, oh, why are you talking about South Africa when there are all these human rights violations in all these other African countries? Um, but that's not what he's saying, right? I mean, like, I, th I think what Gene's saying, which is a very good point, is that, like, there are this certain kinds of um, campus, you know, there's the gray zone people, for example, who it's not just that they weren't focused on what was going on in Syria. Uh, it's, you know, because you could make an argument that, you know, you should prioritize the crimes that are being committed by your own state or its proxies, but it's that they were actively excusing it and they were actively excusing it in ways that are obviously inconsistent with, with their much better views on Israel, Palestine, that, um, that, you know, people would say, Oh, well, you know, Assad is doing is okay. Cause he's fighting Al Qaeda, you know, uh, they, which is, you know, a whole other thing was always bizarre to me, but, uh, but yeah, I, I did just want to say two two things about this. Uh, one, you're you're certainly correct. I think both both Gene and Kuba said versions of this um, that it's not that uh, the Israeli case is um, qualitatively unique. I think it's an extreme case, right? But it's not. Uh, it's not a qualitatively unique mm -hmm. case. I mean, like just about any nationalism around the world has some level of ethno-nationalism in it. Um, you know, that there are like countries where you have more or less of a civic nationalist tradition going against the ethno-nationalist tradition, but you know, the ethno-nationalist element is, is all, you know, is rarely entirely absent. Um, you know, but uh, it's the problem. The thing that leads to the wires on the outside is that Israel is in um you know, is doing ethno-nationalism in demographic circumstances that basically makes it impossible to have an ethno-nationalist project without some pretty extreme ongoing human rights violations. You know, if you're, um, you know, if you're some relatively homogenous country uh, that, uh, you know, in, in a different region of the world, you might be able to be pretty ethno-nationalist without having to do much of anything except for like maybe have restrictive immigration policies, which is all, you know, not great in itself. But uh, whereas in this, the, in the situation, you know, in the context of the demographic situation Israel's in, uh, they end up having to, you know, to, in order to maintain that ethno-nationalist project, they have to, you know, they've had to do all this ethnic cleansing. Uh, they, uh, in, you know, in the forties uh, and now, right. Uh, they, and deny, you know, like people they were ruling over for 56, the last 56 years, citizenship in Israel, because if they, you know, let them become citizens, that would throw off the demographic balance and Israel wouldn't get to exist as a Jewish state anymore. Cause there'd be roughly equal numbers of Jewish and Palestinian citizens. Uh, they end up doing things like they have a law that's been on books or keeps getting renewed, you know, for the last bunch of years, where if you're a Israeli Arab and uh, you like you're an Arab citizen of Israel uh, and you marry a West Bank Palestinian, you can't live together as a married couple in Israel, allegedly for security reasons, but pretty obviously for demographic reasons, right? So all this stuff is really obscene, which is why, you know, for many years, I've I've had a pretty like straightforward anti-Zionist position. I I don't think that Israel has a right to exist as a Jewish state. I don't think any country in the world has a right to maintain its ethnic majority by violating the the rights of others. Um, and you know, even if if somebody told me that they think that the United States has a right to be a white state. And in defense of that right, we should have like exclusionary immigration policies that prevent non-white people from coming over. 
I would, you know, I, uh, I would think that that person was a ugly bigot and, uh, and, and I'd have very little time for them. Right. And like what Israel has done is much, much worse than that. Right. So, which is why I've had this anti-Zionist position for a long time. And it's why, uh, one of the funny things about the last week is that usually, um, my hate mail is, you know, one of the, one of the most reliable elements of my hate mail is Zionist hate mail. Uh, you know, cause, cause I'm usually, you know, I've usually written or said something recently that set them off. Um, and so it's been very funny to spend the last week having a lot of the people who are mad about this article, uh, describing me as a liberal Zionist, which is, you know, kind of amazing. Um, and, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, in the, you know, like a Twitter, since there's something very wrong with me and I engage with this stuff way more than I should, uh, that like I, I will sort of press people on, on some of this. And yeah, I, th I think the logic of the position ends up taking them to, to crazy places. Right. So if you, you know, if you extend the concept of a settler and clearly in the article, I'm not talking about people who are using that term in a sort of very abstract, refined academic way to mean the, the privileged caste of a settler colonial state, you know, that like you no longer be a settler if, you know, if you change the, if you change the political system, but, you know, people who say, Oh, you know, all Israelis are settlers where uh, oftentimes the next sentence is settlers aren't civilians or, um, you know, I'm not going to get mad at indigenous people, you know, um, you know, doing anything to settlers, or if you really believe in a right of return, you know, you should be okay with mass displacing uh, Israelis to to restore the exact land arrangements of uh, an undeveloped country in the 1940s. Uh, and, you know, I, I had somebody on Twitter the other day telling me, oh, like using presenting as if it was a reductio ad absurdum of the view. It's like, oh, so would you say, would you be against, you know, the, you know, like, like, would you have a problem with what the Algerians, you know, did to, you know, the, the French settlers. I was like, yeah, I mean, I think Algerian independence is good. Killing random French civilians is bad. That's i uh... I'll go even further, Ben. I'll go <laughs> even further than this. I would say that the displacement from Ger of Germans from Prussia and uh, other parts of Silesia was probably not a good thing to have happened. No, it's not. I mean, in fact, it's really funny because, like, I saw somebody else who uh, one of the others sort of like, oh, which well, is, that in that what, case, it's what the Zionists will argue that they're doing to the Palestinians because they'll put that they will say, like, you know, I've heard uh, uh, people I know who are hardcore Zionists say, yeah. like, well, you know, after the Second World War, Germans were pushed out of Prussia and Silesia, yes, which is which is horrible. I mean, this is there's a there's a um. Uh, there's an old Nathan Robinson article from current affairs. I do not remember what it's called, but it's the one about Ben Shapiro. It might be called the cool kids philosopher, uh, that, um, so it's one of those classic Nathan Robinson, 10,000 word takedowns of some reactionary figure. And in, uh, and in part of it talks about this old article that Shapiro had written many years ago that he sort of apologized for. Uh, that where he he said uh, he advocated the mass transfer of all Palestinians out of the country. And he said, oh, if you think this is genocide or whatever, it's like, no, it's not Hitler, it's Churchill. And then he he mentioned the, uh, the, the transfers of ethnic Germans uh, out of those areas in Eastern Europe at the end of World War II. And Nathan goes into like long quotes from historians about what that process looked like in practice, which is just as horrific as you would think it would be. Cause there are, there really are not a lot of examples of nice ethnic cleansing in, uh, in world history. So it's like, yes, of course that was, that was a, that was an awful thing. That was a thing that should not have happened. Uh, that's, you know, everybody, like nobody deserves to have fewer rights because they're a member of the wrong ethnicity, whether wrong ethnicity means the one you think is inferior or wrong ethnicity means the one that, you know, where members of that ethnicity haven't been around as long or they came under the wrong circumstances or anything. Right. So, and this is not, and I think this is a very like deep ideological confusion by parts of the contemporary left. So for example, I was reading um, Naomi Klein's book, uh, the new one from last year, Doppelganger. 
And Naomi Klein is somebody I basically like. I think she's you know right about most things, but like um, the I, I think she is very fond of of identity politics. Uh, you know, like 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 I think she sort of buys into all the identity politics catechisms in a way that I'm not crazy about. Uh, and that, you know, and there's a point where she's talking about the, um, the protests, like the, after the discovery of the, uh, the, the evidence of bodies buried by uh, residential schools in Canada. And she's talking about the, the rec- the national reckoning in response to this. And she says, uh, and she, she refers to herself as a settler. She says, you know, uh, settlers like me. Uh, and, uh, and she says uh, that, you know, we can learn how to, you know, be better guests and neighbors on this land. And I remember reading that and thinking, wait a second, you think you're a guest? You think that, like, you have fewer, you have less, right, less of a right to live in Canada because of, of your race, because of who your ancestors were? I mean, if so, somebody who... Like a Guatemalan immigrant uh, in Vancouver who uh, just became a citizen three days ago, I'm sure Naomi Klein would quite rightly rebuke anybody who referred to that person as a guest and said that like it wasn't really their country in the way that it's really the country of Canadians who were born there. And so I'm very, very confused about what the principle is that, you know, that you, you say that like, oh, you know, if you know, that because Naomi Klein isn't descended from the right bloodlines, you know, she's just a guest in the country. I think that's a very unhealthy thing. I think that's impossible to reconcile with left principles. And the last thing I just want to get in here is that I think that, um, I think that oftentimes with this stuff, there is a, uh, there, you know, especially when you talk about land back and all of that, I think that there's a very libertarian conception of justice going on here. Mm. A very, a very not leftist conception of justice. If you think about, like, the last section of Capital, when uh, the you know so there are eight sections of that book. The last section is the one on primitive accumulation. Talks about the enclosures, the process by which, you know, the majority of English and Scottish people were driven off of their land, the you know lands, uh, in the process of the rise of capitalism. And of course, the conclusion is well, of course, there's no turning back the clock, but this expropriation lays the groundwork for expropriating the expropriators and creating this better society. And that same kind of distinction is the distinction between somebody like Rawls and somebody like Nozick that uh, a, um, you know, that a left liberal philosopher like Rawls is, is looking at, okay, how equal or fair is the distribution of resources right now? And a libertarian like Nozick is looking at, Oh, did it come about the right way? And I'd say, if you have a conception of justice, that's about trying to turn back the clock to the property arrangements of some point in the past, rather than trying to create a more equal society going forward. I think you have landed on the wrong end of a really fundamental divide. Yeah. Let me just add a little historical context to that as well. If we look at the history and and this is not my area of expertise by any means, but I have some passing familiarity with the academic literature on this. If we look at the territory that comprises Israel Palestine today, you know, uh, the the privatization of land and the creation of modern capitalist relations, you know, dates back from the Ottoman period. And many of the problems that gave rise to, you know, uh, uh, you know, that are directly linked to the kind of Israel Palestine issue today, um, we we see those coming into being. Because, for example, land is privatized, landowners in Beirut and Damascus get control of that land and then sell that land from underneath the peasantry's feet, right? So returning back necessarily to to a uh, pre-Nakba set of economic relations in Palestine is not something that can be done. It's not realistic and it's not even desirable. You know, the, the, the you know, when we talk about land, you know, the complete nationalization of land. Uh, by uh, by a binational state would probably be, be an important precondition to resolving these issues, not uh, having to like uh, re-adjudicate, you know, capitalist land relations. Anyway, sorry, I, I jumped in there. Cooper? Yeah, I could tell that some of the examples cited were, inte- <clears throat> were intended to bait me into a response. Uh, <laughs> Wrocław, 
Szczecin, these are and have eternally been Polish cities with uh, true Slavic blood mixed <laughs> in the mortar, the clay of every brick, the very structures. Which was just because it was the cheapest building supply available at the time. <laughs> exactly, exactly. The, um, the children's blood was actually um, there. You get less per unit, but it sticks better. Um, <laughs> But I think that um, I don't find anything to object with the notion that expelling millions of civilians from uh, their homes, places that they've lived for generations, places that they want to continue to live, is a positive, acceptable um, course of action, regardless of if those civilians are Palestinians or Israelis or Jews or Germans or polls, the, and one reason why we need to be careful about entertaining arguments about indigeneity and historical claims to land is because it leads to that kind of ethnic cleansing. If there's one justification for inhabiting territory and that is indigeneity, and it is not something that can be shared, ultimately everyone else needs to leave right, is there merely at the sufferance of the people who belong to that bloodline. It's a literal bloodline. And the West, the contemporary international legal system, has tried since World War II in different ways, um, maybe even earlier in some uh, idealist communities, to move away from notions that tie blood and soil together. Uh, different countries have had different levels of success. Canada, my much maligned Canada, is um, actually a pretty good example of a country where that link between blood and soil is not the basis of your mm -hmm. rights as a Canadian. Although, actually, the engagement with First Nations land claims and things like um, land acknowledgement rituals reopen that debate except with a different group privileged as the holy landlords the um and i can't i'm not going to apologize for the expulsion of germans after world war ii um i think that once the mechanisms of blood and soil ethnic warfare start rolling then this is precisely what happens and it's precisely why we need to stop them why we need to prevent land disputes from being understood defined justified in these terms and it's uh not an isolated incident right the ironically uh, vladimir putin in the debate that uh, in his interview with tucker carlson the one where uh, ben and i did uh, an analysis he uses historical claims and justifications and letters from Bogdan Khmelnytsky to justify uh, the invasion of Ukraine and presumably at some point either an ethnic cleansing or some kind of partition of Ukrainian territory. And the reality too is that as your empire expands and you absorb new areas which have their own historical claims, this process can go on forever. You can use it to justify ultimately imperial uh, universal empire by saying that, well, when we absorbed Ukraine, then that meant that we are the inheritors of the Kievan Rus, which means that uh, Belarus and the Baltic states that had Varangian settlements also belong to us. And once you take the Baltic, well, because of our stewardship of the Baltic tribes, right, it's actually the entire coast all the way to Denmark that belongs to us on an indigeneity claim. And I believe that this is when it's not forwarded as an emanation of some kind of mystical, historic, mythological, mythologized history, like you get uh, claims from the Old Testament or um, going back all the way to Noah's Ark to justify Israeli occupation of um, uh, Palestine, Israel, the West Bank. Now, 
Those people believe in it, but it's wrong. Other people like Putin are just using it as an instrument to um, manipulate opinion and to um, try to reorder what is an invasion and a conquest into um, some type of liberatory uh, campaign. Gene, did you want to say something? Yeah, and I would, I, I, you know, I agree. I get, I agree with Cuba. Once you set in motion uh, a kind of ethno-national politics, you know, it has a uh, has a chain reaction that leads to the degeneration of society, the fragmenting of people, the unmixing of people, to use a kind of more academic phraseology about it. And you know, ideologically, really, you know. I think Ben is right in highlighting as much as people don't like to hear it, but like a, a lot of these arguments merely just kind of invert the nationalist logic of the other side's argument. You know, this is the, we see this everywhere with identity politics. You know, Ibram X. Kendi is the intellectual heir of Strom Furman, right? <laughs> that's, you know, that's what it is. One, you, it, you know, you become, once you center your, the issue on adjudicating historical barbarisms. Well, guess what? History is a literary of barbarism and we can all pick and choose which barbarisms we want to emphasize and which we don't want to emphasize in order to construct a nationalist na a narrative. I think it was uh, Renan who said, you know, na nations is not just about remembering, it's also about forgetting certain things that happened in the past. So, you know, if we want to have, and I think large parts of the left or the so-called left, are under the influence of an extremely right-wing preposition, you know, a, 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 a extremely right-wing kind of premise of their politics is, with, is in the sense that they don't reject nationalism, identity politics, and racism, but rather they think that the solution to these historical injustice is merely inverting the normative values associated with particular ethno-national racial groups. We can look historically at how nations and communities and conflicts take place. We can, we can, uh, we can even apportion blame for these uh, conflicts. But critically, as Cooper, I think, was you know, is hinting at, you know, he doesn't need to apologize for the ethnic cleansing of Germans from Poland, because he didn't fucking do it, right? You know, he wasn't involved in doing it. Collective guilt is another extremely pernicious thing. You know, a lot of these people claim to be freaking Marxists. Well, but, but what if people say that Cuba inherited the benefits of that ethnic cleansing? Well, Poland's not much really benefit to inheriting. <laughs> wow. Wow. No, All right. no, no that's, that would have been my response as well. <laughs> but you know even if you yeah. know like this, this is also i don't i mean like, you like know. Let's, let's actually dwell on that thought a little bit right that they um that you're that you know kuba is inheriting the benefits or that um you know you and i even if uh even if uh, neither of us exactly have lineages that go back to the mayflower are uh, inheriting the benefits of the the dispossession of Native Americans or um, I think Zal you know, does though. Zal. Oh yeah, Zal for Zal's sure. Mother, Zal for Zal's sure. mother is the daughter of an Amer the American Revolution. <laughs> yeah, well, also of course, you know, I, I really like Uri Strauss. Um, did a like a medium post that was inspired by my article where he ran the numbers to show that like almost everybody in the world is descended from almost everybody who lived you know uh more than you know like uh a few hundred years ago basically right like uh just because the you know it, t it takes the tiniest little bits of uh of intermixing to make that like mathematically guaranteed even in pretty isolated uh communities but um but yeah look i mean i think that they you know because because i think there is also something that's like really deeply reactionary about this idea Right. Because if we're talking about ordinary working class people in Poland or Canada or the United States or anywhere else, right, they have a, and you're saying, well, the thing that's sort of objectionable here is even if they didn't do it, right, they inherited the benefit of doing it. Well, what 
what's the benefit that you're talking about exactly? Right. Like it's, it's, it, you know, like if you think about the, that they're allowed to live there, I mean, surely we think everybody should be allowed to live there. I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, um, all else being equal immigration restrictions are very bad. Right. Or if, uh, or is it just that they kind of have a decent life with an okay standard of living? Is that like a special benefit that is suspect? Uh, I don't think so. I think that everybody, right, should should have that. I think everybody should, um, you know, in fact, I think that the vast majority of people in these societies don't have nearly a good enough life. Otherwise, I wouldn't be a socialist, right? Like, I think that the, you know, if I'm, if I'm a socialist, if I object to the current economic system, it's because I don't think it is delivering nearly as good a life to the majority of the population in these countries as it should. So when you start saying, oh, that, you know, you're, you're benefiting, you're benefiting from this like unearned privilege of living here and having like a decent life. It's like, no, it's, it's not nearly good enough. We should demand better. Yeah, I, I would just add. I would. I would oh, go ahead. I would uh, chime in too that um, when there is a case of dispossession, genocide, ethnic cleansing, whether it's occurring in Gaza, whether it occurred in Bosnia, Croatia, Serbia, and there are individuals that can be held responsible as well as individuals that can be compensated, that should be part of a measured, responsible. A policy, a program, punish people who do the bad things and try to make people whole as much as possible and as far as you can uh, that have experienced this kind of dislocation. When it comes to the descendants of individuals who may or may not have done things, well, are all American whites descended from uh, colonists and slavers? Well, presumably a, a whole bunch of them Presumably a whole bunch of them are not, but they could be descended from Sicilian pirates and uh, upcountry brigands in Scotland that have also done terrible things and their descendants somehow benefit from. The, I don't think that there's an individual responsibility to anyone based on their descent to try to remediate some kind of ancient injustices. And I think that many states, Canada included, moving towards some kind of reconciliation and compensation for colonized peoples and their descendants, that's appropriate. It should be organized through states. States are the actors in, uh, in many of these uh, that committed these types of crimes. They're the bodies that represent and last transhistorically connect um, the current situation with uh, with previous epochs, and um, they're available to do something about it. Now, I think that rather than looking at it from the point of view of some restoration, um, from a material perspective, like Ben said, everyone should based on this level of productivity in the global economy based on the countries that uh, we live in and the, the wealth that's been piled up by all of these dead generations um people should have more a lot more and it should be universally and broadly shared not on the basis of your ancestors being criminals or your ancestors being victims but on the basis of our shared common personhood and the Ideally, that would take care of the material issue and the reconciliation process would be one having more to do with culture, more to do with recognition, and more to do with establishing a shared society that acknowledges the problems of the past rather than just brushing them off the table or celebrating them as great national achievements. I think that's pretty fair enough. I think I think yeah, we have like a big nationalism problem uh, on the left that we just have we just refuse we refuse to deal with. I mean, to return to a lot of the discourse about Isra Israel Palestine, certainly, like when we look at like what's happening in Israeli society now, we're looking at a society that's like going through a real barbarous degeneration into like 
bloodthirsty behavior. You know, if you want to see, if you want to see a quote unquote democratic society descend into into madness, you can just flip on TikTok right now because more than anything, the left is doing uh, is the IDF on TikTok is is doing for the Palestinian cause because people see what's going on and people see what 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 the IDF and the and large segments of the Israeli public are doing. But if we, you know, from a political sense, almost being like uh, having your dichotomy as like it's the 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 indigenous Palestinians versus the Israeli settlers, uh, just seems like a bad political stance, a stance as well. Because I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong, Ben. You know a lot more about Marxism and the history of Marxism than I do. But I think like traditionally, a lot of people on the left used to be all about splitting the working class away from their ruling class. And by reinforcing that discourse about like, oh, you know, all Israelis are guilty. Well, well, yeah, then they're going to fight to the death, right? It's it's just yeah. like, it's just like people who go and like white people, this white, just like, do you really want white people to start thinking themselves as white people and acting collectively at white people? No, you want to exploit the fishes within that society. Yeah, and, as, and a, as I believe Kuba said, I think the, uh, I think it's probably a bad idea in the long term to encourage white people to spend more time thinking about their whiteness. Exactly. Uh, that historically leads nowhere good, right? Like, And let's uh, not forget the Palestinian ruling class as well has been hook and crook in this either as kind of stooges for the Israeli occupation force, or uh, it, uh, or as being a pretty re uh, socially reactionary uh, Islamist political organization. So, you know, people on the left talk a, a freaking big game, but, you know, they don't believe in their principles. And I frankly believe a lot of the fucking hysteria on the Western left about Gaza is less about fucking Gaza and more about a bunch of failed leftists in the West. Millennial de left fucking packed it in and fucked up. We missed our chance. We missed the fucking boat. And we're in the same shitty position we were eight years ago. Uh, it's just that you can like fucking find a DSA chapter now and again around the place. <laughs> we're, we're in a, the same shitty position. So because we've been defeated here, We've I now projected out our so, fantasies so, of so doing now. I, 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 I don't of the fact that we finally have our democratic standard bearer uncommitted. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I. Um, I I'm mean, so look. But but that said, right? Uh, look, I don't disagree that the left in America in 2024 is profoundly fucked. I mean, you'd have to be very delusional not to not to see that. Uh, but. And I also don't disagree that some of the people who are like the maddest about the article, for example, do sort of. Well, let's say it, fucking Aaron Mate, that Whoa. fucking psychopath scumbag mm. who is mm. shilled for the Assad regime, which has killed millions of people in the name of fighting Islamism, because, you know, the people they were fighting were assholes too, butchered the people of Aleppo. And this son of a bitch is being lauded by the fucking left as being, look, he does good journalism. It may be motivated journalism. He does good journalism, but his lack of consistency and his utter sociopathy is just fucking nuts. So the guy um, can go fuck himself in the ass along um, with the rest of those fucking gray zone cuts. Like, let's be honest. Show. Let's yes. be honest. Like, Max, Man, you, you, you were hoping to monetize yeah, yeah, this, were you, Jason? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Look at oh. those dead eyes, right? Dead eyes, right? This See is. FBI yeah. agent. I, I, I'm also. Anyway, that's enough for me today. I'm also not a I'm also not a fan of Mr. Mate, uh, but the on the more general point, uh, who who did by the way lie about the article? <laughs> Fucking lie, lying but, son uh, of a bitch. But um, uh, quoted in a very misleading way and kind of summarized the argument in almost the opposite of the you know he sort of like took it as a. Uh, <laughs> Is you know oh Israelis are the real indigenous ones, which is almost the opposite of the point, right? Uh, so that's the that's the Aaron Mate piece. But uh, put it aside, you know I understand that the most important thing is uh, which other people in left media I have beefs with. That that's like obviously what we should focus on. But it's not about it's not about you having beefs with le other people in left media. It's about whole sections of left media 
crying their fucking eyes about, about Gaza, acting like their only concern is humanitarianism. After we've spent the last goddamn decade, these people shilling for a whole bunch of indefensible regimes. Look, if you're going to be consistent about things and you don't like these horrible ethnic regimes, then, you know, like, let's be fair about them behind, uh, around the board. But if the Palestinians were getting U.S. aid to fight Israel, a Chinese proxy, these very same people would be, like, defending Israel's right uh, of existence. Just like you see all these contrarian leftists in Spike magazine and uh, who's that? Who's that? The, 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 the Frank Ferruti guy. All these people who cry all day about identity politics in the West is killing everybody. But all of a sudden, there's a there's a terrorist attack in Israel and they've all become the biggest defenders of Jewish ex, uh, ethnic exceptionalism and how like the only way for the Jewish people to be safe is to have their own ethno state. None of these motherfuckers are consistent. Like at least have bad politics and be consistent. The you know it's like I don't know. I'm fed up. With yeah. That. Uh, so I agree uh, let me cut you off real quick here, Ben. Let me cut you off real quick here, Ben, and just make a public service announcement for TIR. Uh, the statements made by Jean Bajelon. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, here I'll, I'll, I'll. I I'll sound speak. unhinged, Charles. You go fuck yourself, you dumb oh, fuck. Okay, you Gene, are man. Gene. Yeah. First of all, can we not fuck anybody? This, this is yeah. a fuck freak show. It's a fuck, uh, fuck free zone. No, I do, no, I do want to say the, something. I'll, well, look, you know, and I know that if there's going to be fucking, it's in the champagne room. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, I did just want to make one go actual. Ahead, like like one actual substantive point and one plug because I know we're like wrapping, you know, we're we're nearing we're nearing, you know, the end time here. Um that uh so that you know, I do agree with a lot of what Gene says. I wouldn't put it as colorfully, but I agree with a lot of what he says about um certainly the hypocrisies of certain kinds of third worldists. Uh and um, then uh, he has, um, and and also on the sort of bad structural position of the left right now, right? Like obviously, you know, things are grim. It would be ridiculous to deny that. Uh, but uh, but I do also, you know, I don't want to, you know, just attribute what you're talking about to that because the fact is that you did get, um, you did get a, uh, you know, a hundred thousand people in my home state, uh, 10 times as many as the Trump Biden difference in 2016, uh, voting uncommitted, uh, which, which I actually find incredibly encouraging. And you do have a lot of people who are not just like powerless lefties. You have a lot of normies who are actually very, very angry, about what they're seeing on their TV screens right now, what they're seeing if they see these deranged IDF uh, TikToks that uh, that Gene is uh, is talking about, uh, to you know the point that there you know there really is. It's not just like the let you know. I'm obviously I'm the canceling comedians guy. I'm never going to deny the existence of left ridiculousness. Uh, it's real. But uh, but quite separate from that, right? There really is a tidal wave of, I think, authentic, organic anger about this. I mean, there are polls where 50% of the people who voted for Biden in 2020 think that what's going on right now is a genocide. Uh, and, you know, 30% aren't sure. Uh, this is, you know, this is a real thing and it's an important thing. And it's right, right? And this is like, you know, that, you know I counted up before, you know, this is um, this article is the depending on how you count it, the 16th or 17th thing I've written for Jacobin about Israel Palestine. Uh, I think just since just since October, uh, and this is this is something I care about a lot, and I have for a long time. I have I have uh, you know, it's been an issue with people in my life in the past, right? You know how 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 much this is this issue is a big deal to me, right? This is. And, and, and I think, and I, you know, but the way that the reason I've always been an anti-Zionist is because I believe in human rights and I believe that human rights are for all humans. 
Uh, and I think that that's enough, right? To uh, to. Uh, but who are the humans? Ah. <laughs> God, that's grim. Uh, so you know, I mean, this is like this is my article where you know I'm you know I am venting at like a lot of rhetoric I see online that I don't like, and that you know my long term frustration <laughs> with why I think land acknowledgements or reactionary ethno-nationalism. That is something I've been saying for years. Uh, I don't think anything is the land of any, any ancestral group. Uh, but, but the, the, you know, but the whole point is to frame anti-Zionism in a way that is plausible and, uh, and actually makes sense in principle. And by the way, I think is a lot more likely to move more people because I think most normies, are more likely to be won over by you can't do this to human beings than um, oh you know all uh, all members of indigenous groups. But, you know, should have but, but, but I think we all agree, and yeah. in my lifetime, I've never seen such support for a ceasefire from people that are for the most part apolitical, right? I'm you you. I'm definitely saying that I'm right. And, and, and I, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, um, beyond mainstream media, uh, and I've said this before and I'll say it again, Elon Musk kind of saying, fuck it with Twitter. This is a political project for him. And I, I don't know if this is a backfire or not, but because they let people go willy nilly with the images, we can see 24 seven. Oh, a hundred percent. What's going on? And Jason, I, 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 I would just, just jump in quickly here like a hundred percent because you know for years there's there's a kind of gaslighting discourse around israel is the only democracy the palestinians are like this the palestine israel is the most moral army in the mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. we're sitting here right watching videos of the uh, you know of what the idf is doing rifling through women's underpants executing old women bombing people creating a famine starving people uh, you have to be deluded not to see that this is a genocidal campaign at the same time we're seeing that these you know hamas did atrocities but we're seeing a lot of the sensationalists and i'll give uh, uh, i'll give credit to that sob aramate for reporting this is that you know a lot of these claims about the mass rape Where's the evidence? Like, you could persuade me if you showed me evidence, but like, you aren't showing me evidence. Where were these babies? So people, I yeah. think, are feeling yeah. that they've been chumped. Yeah. They've been chumped for years and years. They've been lied to. And the Israelis haven't ha helped themselves because in the last 10 years, with the rise of these populist white people, the there is a kind of degeneration in the abilities of the uh, professional managerial class to perform Westernness in the name of Israel and to get Israel's message across because you just have straight up like religious lunatics like my Kurdish brother, brother Ben Gavir, who should be making people unhappy in Kurdistan and not in, 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 in Palestine if the world was just. And uh, all these people are just like totally just not even playing the game anymore of trying to like so sugarcoat what's happening for Western liberals. And people are seeing with their own eyes. It's been building up for 10 years, but this is just absolute, straight up, vile, disgusting barbarism. And what makes it so disgusting is that when you looked at the barbarism of a regime like Assad or the militias in Iraq or what happened in Azerbaijan, Armenia, these are dictatorial, very like extremely authoritarian dictatorial uh, regimes. Like we don't know how much public support these regimes really have. But in Israel, like, you know, Israelis like to go and blame the uh, Palestinians for voting for Hamas when most of them were like, you know, still in the womb or twinkling their parents' eyes at the time. But the Israeli public voted for these lunatics, right? So this, you know, th this is this is like quite disturbing. I think people. I would still hesitate to say let's collectively blame all, all Israelis, but there does seem to be a, a certain amount of popular support for what is genocide. And I would, um, I think that building on the idea of how do you reach normies, why are normies reacting to this? If you think about the revulsion towards the Axis powers during World War II, mm -hmm. some of that was ideological, but the centrality of the Holocaust 
in condemnations of the Third Reich, that's something that's retroactively um, projected onto that period. Most people didn't even know about it. Most people, it was a niche issue. But there was a basic disgust with the sheer brutality, the unreasonable savagery of fascist forces, um, wherever they invaded, wherever they occupied. A feeling that this type of overt, large-scale, unapologetic, in-your-face violence and deceit, you know, are, who are you going to trust, me or your lying eyes, that is one thing that transcends any type of political affiliation and reaches people at their basic humanity. The it's, and this is what I think we're experiencing right now. The reality of what's going on in Gaza, you can't really dress it up. You can't really spin it once you've seen it. And the reaction to the in, uh, initial incursion by Hamas and the uh, slaughter of uh, hundreds, thousand, you know, over a thousand Israelis also triggered that kind of reaction. And Israel could have, like the United States after September 11th, with a restrained policy, with uh, uh, something that recognized the humanity of the Palestinians and focused the retribution onto people who were directly involved and not any, not this insanely disproportionate collective punishment, could have cultivated that feeling, that sentiment around the world uh, for its favor. But not, not only has it squandered it, but through this response, with its visible brutality, its deceptiveness, its utter contempt for any kind of limits based on our notions of human rights, that's what's getting you such a groundswell of support for Palestine. Well, on that note, yeah. So, so, oh, so sorry, sorry. I did just, just, I just, just, just the shit out of me on my own show. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just feel like, um, um, you know, if I don't do the necessary bit of self promotion here, uh, they're not going to keep making me associate producer on all those movies. So, uh, <laughs> like now, he clearly doesn't have the instinct. You know, uh, you're so. a star kid. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, I, I have always loved that culturally sensitive um, <laughs> <laughs> impression that you do. Um, but yeah, no, I have. Uh, so as I said, uh, you know, in this case, I think there's a, you know, way of doing anti-Zionism wrong. That's something that, you know, I was, I was trying to address in this article, but of course, 99% of what I've written about this has just been, you know, doing straightforward, uh, arguing against, you know, uh, spurious defenses for, you know, Israeli war crimes, arguing, you know, against Zionism, et cetera. And uh, in that, you know, and, um, you know, that's always been my primary uh, interest in this. And so uh, anybody who might be watching in my home state, uh, Michigan, I, I saw um, somebody, you know, making a hurtful comment about my beautiful Lansing Community College shirt. <laughs> Uh, in the uh, in the chat, but uh, anybody who's watching in my home state in Michigan uh, next Thursday, so Thursday the twenty first in Detroit at Wayne State University, uh, old main building, room one hundred three at six o'clock. I'm going to be uh, giving a talk that's co sponsored by Detroit DSA and another DSA chapter, I do not remember off the top of my head, my apologies for that, uh, that is uh, just called Debunking the Many Bad Arguments Made by Israel's Apologists in the West. So, um, and, you know, if you, um, uh, so yeah, you should come out, you know, if you uh, if you have, and, you know, whatever, if you think uh, if you think I suck, you should still come out and say so in the Q&A, because that'll make it a more interesting Q&A. Uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, it's time that you have your... Um your Norm Finkelstein moment and then make a you know, shut up. <laughs> shut up. Yeah. My no, mother's from Cleveland. <laughs> yes. That's, that's, that's all, that's all I'm going to, that's all I'm going to do in the Q and A. I'm, I'm just going <laughs> to do, 
do my high, most high pitched voice and tell people to shut up, <laughs> shut up as is my custom. I'm actually, no, I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to bring, he's going to be backstage. So people won't know he's there, but I'm going to bring Gene with me. And then, uh, <laughs> if there's like a particularly spicy Q and a question, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to like, Oh, I'm sorry. We have a special guest and going to do no, it like a jerk. Jerry Again. Springer episode, and you know he's going to start screaming. Well, now we, we can slip in God the and come on instead. <laughs> your brother, the wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Gene. If your brother's a wrestler, you're doing a great job of being the manager that gets the wrestler hyped up. Because I'll be the hype man for the wrestler. I'm telling I th- you. I think we're all pretty, pretty hyped. Uh, I don't know what you could possibly say in the champagne room. Um. Oh, I've got some things to say. I'm- <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> if, look, if it makes yeah, anyone, if that's if that's, if that's what's going on on the main stage, just imagine the champagne. Oh, Jesus Christ! I'm excited now. I'm excited now. I. <sighs> yeah. You know, I post- in, in, yeah. In all, in all, in all fairness, uh, you know, we've been all having our own little issues with the world in which we exist in in this online media thing and we've all had our own personal conversations with each other um i definitely had one with uh, jean bajlan earlier today a uh, little bit i didn't know that he was saving it all up for tonight so i'm excited for the champagne room if you are watching the show on ben burgess's uh, channel i'll give them an argument he also has a link um and he will be having it for his patrons as well yeah. So wherever when, I, you're when I posted it, I said the champagne room was going to start 10 minutes ago, but you know, whatever, it'll start soon. Well, you know, they got free champagne. All you guys got some free champagne. Um, I want to thank everyone for watching comments. Even, even if you disagreed with what was said on the screen, I appreciate uh, your engagement in this conversation, wherever you're watching this show, be it, uh, on this is revolution or give them an argument there should be a link in the description to ben's article and if you disagree with it if you disagree with any of the comments leave a comment and tell us how you really feel gene bajalon style that's the best way (laughs) to you know you really want to get under anyone's skin on the screen leave one of those long essay length comments those are kind nice. of sounds like you're agreeing, but you're also like shitting them. Oh man, points. I love it. When well, I did, I did. I did enjoy. There was. A, I don't usually uh, catch majority report anymore, uh, you know, because I work at that time. But the other day, I had it on, and they had a caller who I think was a Black Power Media fan who came on. Oh yeah, calling him as, and, and all I could think about is like, um, Jared Ball's Jewish. <laughs> Isn't isn't that what isn't that what we're on right now? Black Power Media is that what this trend is? Right is that you have oh. an unnatural allegiance to losers does not like you. That's a joke. <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, let's are you gonna stop me? No, I'm, so, I'm, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I get the names of shows confused. This is the uh, this is the Revolutionary Blackout Network. Oh, Blackout. now this one is not a joke. <laughs> You have been an unnatural. <laughs> the first one, total joke. The second one, Look, I just don't serious. think it's appropriate to make jokes about people with learning difficulties on this show. Okay. So let's go to the champagne room. <laughs> you know what? Hold on. Gene, Gene, you deserve this for the main show. And we never do this on the main show, but you deserve this because you kind of killed it. Here it comes. <laughs> Kind of deserve that, Gene Bajlan. Uh, wherever you are watching this show, there are links to our Patreon where we have a link up for our champagne room. You for just three dollars a month or thirty dollars for the year, you can have access to champagne rooms past and present. We are doing a movie night this Friday, which should be a good time. Jason makes this. I have no problem with with Jared Ball and the Black Power Media people. I think. Jared, he does good interviews. Jared Bull does good interviews. Jared is a nice. He he wrote a very important book, and Jared does something that none of us can do. He pissed off a Grammy Award winning rapper so much the dude wrote a diss song about. Him. Wrote a diss song about Jared Ball. Yeah, Jared Ball fucking got under Killer Mike's skids. I mean, he was right. He Jared good. Ball. 
Jared right. Ball, critical support for Jared Ball and his war against <laughs> uh, Killer Mike. So, yeah. So, there you go. That, we can joke. Um, you know, Pascal's gone on the show. They don't have me on for whatever reason. Yeah. But anyway. Uh... <laughs> If you're listening on Apple, subscribe. You can get a link to the Champagne Room as well. You can hear the more unhinged rants of my good friend, Mean Gene Bajlan. And let's just calm it down a little bit with cartoons. Thank you, guys. We'll be back tomorrow with Big Waz and Coach Will. We're talking yeah. some basketball. We are out.